Welcome to a podcast about Hilton Head Island and the Low Country. I am your host, Jay McCain. Today's episode is about the nonprofit organization Hilton Head Heroes. We will hear from Greg Russell about Hilton Head Heroes, what it does, how it came to be, and some stories about some of the families they have helped. Join me as we travel to a very special house down 278 to Lighthouse Road. Greg, thank you for being here and joining us today. My pleasure. Thanks. So tell me about the Heroes Project, what it is and how the idea came to you. Well, um, you know, I used to uh, travel quite a lot uh, doing shows and for conventions and colleges and uh, just anything and everything. And I got uh, uh, very tired of just sitting in hotel rooms. And so I made it a habit of uh, visiting children's hospitals around the country and whatever city I happened to be in. And I'd go in and and, uh, they would gather all the kids who who could come into a gathering room and just do my little thing like I do in Harbortown and then would individually go around room to room to those kids who couldn't leave their uh, their room for for whatever reason. And I was doing uh, work with Make-A-Wish and other organizations like that, Ronald McDonald Houses, so on and so forth, Give the Kids the World at Disney. And, and I thought, well, you know what? I'm, I live in paradise. I live in the best place in the world. Maybe we could somehow find a way to invite sick children and their families to come spend some time here on Hilton Head. So with my resources and relationships here, I started asking um, people, would they donate a timeshare or a villa or a house and restaurants for meals and that sort of thing. And my wife and I started Hilton Head Heroes. And thank goodness we didn't know what we were doing because we just kind of stumbled through it and and into it and found what worked and what didn't work. And uh, I met a family in Augusta, Georgia, and and, uh, met a little family in the hospital up there and and uh, he was the first child of a family that we decided we would invite to come down it was close by they could drive here he had seen Hilton Head on the on CBS on the golf tournament and he really wanted to come so we made that happen and and that was the first of uh, almost an endless stream now of of families that over the last 20 plus years, we have invited from the major children's hospitals around the country to come along with their family and grandma and come stay in the Hero House, which is located down in Sea Pines. And they spend a cost free week here and we take care of them with restaurants and grocery stores and dolphin cruises and movie tickets and everything else you can imagine. And we just give them the opportunity to have a week together away from doctors and tubes and treatments. And in the words of one mother, just take a deep breath and feel, in their words, not mine, normal for a week. Because when you have a sick child, the whole family is sick. Uh, Mom and dad are working extra jobs or back and forth from the hospital and the siblings are sloughed off with family friends or grandma and and the house is topsy turvy and the sick child is getting all the attention and it's it's just bad for everybody. And they run through insurance money and um, I can't even imagine what it's like to go through 30, 40, 50 chemo treatments with a with a four year old or blood transfusions or operations and and so they come here and and at least for a brief moment they can at least put that on a back burner and uh, ride bikes and go pet the horses at uh, at Lawton Stables and we have a big beach wheelchair where uh, uh, they can uh, roll a child all the way down to the ocean. A lot of our families that come here have never even been to the beach. Uh, a lot of our families don't have a telephone. In the early days, my wife would have to arrange a time where she would call a public phone out in front of a 7-Eleven somewhere where the mom could walk and and 
talk to us, communicate with us that way. Uh, to never have eaten in a restaurant with a tablecloth, as they say. These are unique experiences for a lot of families, some that we take for granted. And so there are a whole list of requirements. Uh, obviously, a family couldn't afford to do this on their own, but we basically just adopt them for the week and and uh, and take care of them and just try to give them a moment of sunshine in what can be uh, uh, very dark days for them. You mentioned your wife, Lindy, and her involvement in this entire project. What is her role and, and how does uh, she play that role in this well, effort? She is the executive director, and we have a very strong board of directors who all take on a task, whether it's maintaining the house or fundraising or uh, public relations work or uh, giving tours through the house. There's a variety of things. The host families p- play an important role here. So Lindy not only coordinates all of the families who are coming, but she coordinates all the efforts that um, our our board of directors uh, does. And we do major events where we, you know, this costs a lot of money for us to do. And fortunately, we live in a an environment where um, there uh, there is wealth. And uh, if people believe in what you're doing, then they are willing to share that wealth to uh, uh, try to help out and our needs when uh, when we started out our needs were very modest but they were always met and now our needs are not as modest uh, but our needs have always been met so we live in a very caring giving supportive community when you first started this and started going around asking for donations and to use you know timeshares or villas or whatever it was was it hard to get people involved what was the the response and the reaction? Well, it wasn't as hard as you think because people are willing to share what they have. But the the problem came of trying to hook our calendar up with things that have been donated. When you have a sick kid, your calendar is very fluid and and it changes daily. So we would get a timeshare donated to us and we have a family uh, locked into that date. And then two days before they're supposed to get here, uh, this uh, child takes a turn for the worse or they can't come because of a treatment. Now I have to call the timeshare owner and say, well, not only Did you not use it because you donated it to us? Now, we're not going to use it either. So that was a challenge, and that's why our board stressed and pushed strongly for us to own our own place where we could control everything about it. And although Lindy and I were very reluctant to take on a $750,000 mortgage and then remodel the house and make it wheelchair friendly and all the rest of it. Not only was that a challenge, it was, it made us committed more so than uh, we had ever been before. And I'm happy to tell you that two years ago, we were able, we had to burn the mortgage party and we were able to pay off that debt in full. So the state of South Carolina has honored us as one of their angel charities uh, because of programming and funding and um, the assets that we have are used in such a way that we meet the highest standards set forth by the state. Uh, for 501c3 organizations. Tell me a little bit more about the house, how you came about it and where it is, what you had to do to get it ready to host these families because you know, there's definitely some challenges um, with uh, very sick children. Yeah, well, it's a, it's a wonderful house. It's in Sea Pines. It's within a stone's throw of, of Harbor Town on the bike path. And when we bought the house, it was in need of some updating anyway. So uh, we were able to purchase the house and then go in and, and do some remodeling and tell you a story. It, it was empty uh, and um, a fellow board member uh, and uh, in another organization that he and I were are on um, for Hargrave, which is the uh, telephone company here. He and I are, have been on this board of directors for a long, long time. And we were at a, a, a function, and he leaned over to me and said, 
tell me about this hero house you're doing. And I, I told him all about it. And he owned uh, back then uh, the, the big furniture uh, company here on on Hilton Head, the big furniture store. He said, well, how are you, how are you going to furnish the house? I said, well, <laughs> we haven't gotten that far yet. We're just trying to get it ready. He said, well, don't do anything till you hear from me. So a few weeks later, we were at the house uh, painting and getting it ready, and these two big trucks pull up out into the driveway. And I walked out there, and the guy said, he looked at his clipboard, he said, are you Greg Russell? I said, yeah. He said, is this the Hilton Head Hero House? I said, yeah. He said, we got some furniture for you. I went, well, there's a mistake. We didn't order furniture. This gentleman who owned Plantation Interiors went to all of his providers and they started unloading sofas and beds and lamps and everything you can imagine. And he furnished this house, not with ratty, you know, old discarded furniture, but new, brand new furniture. The guys that laid all the tile floor throughout the whole house did it at their uh, with with no cost. The people who clean the pool every week do it free of charge. The people who deliver bright, shiny bicycles every week do it with no charge. And they've done it for years and years and years. That's the kind of community that we live in. When people see a really good thing, they tend to get behind it and support it. And it's amazing stories like that that make the hero's house what it is. How do you spread the word out to these families about what you're doing? That You tell me a little bit before we started this about your relationship with the hospitals and the social workers. Explain to our listeners how that works. Well, we have wonderful relationships with uh, most of the uh, uh, preeminent children's hospitals, mostly east of the Mississippi, like Arnold Palmer's Children's Hospital in Orlando or Duke or Eggleston in Atlanta or, you know, there's a long, long list. And each of those hospitals has social workers that tends to outside hospital needs of the families that they are serving, whether it's helping them get light bills paid or whatever. So we rely on these social workers for um, recommendations of very special families they feel are deserving and could use this um, kind of opportunity. So they fill out a long application online. And of course, none of these families really could afford to do this on their own. Their finances are stretched to the limit as it is with everything going on back home. And so uh, we review uh, these applications and try to spread it out and, and make a priority for the kids who you know aren't going to make it much longer, who are just coming out of chemo treatment and they're on an on an uptick, feeling well enough to make a trip like this. So there are a lot of requirements uh, for the families who, number one, get recommended to us, but that it's tough playing Solomon. And who who actually gets an invitation? Like right now for this year, our house is totally booked for the whole year. So my wife, Lindy, and, and our board members play a vital role of making those tough choices. And people are get disappointed because obviously there's no shortage of sick kids and, and families that uh, could use something like this. The house has been active for over 20 years now. Where all have these uh, families come from and, and how many have you hosted over the years? Well, we're, we're approaching, if we not haven't passed it now, a, a thousand families who come and spend a week at a time. Now, this is not like a Ronald McDonald house. Uh, this is a big four or five bedroom house with its own pool and only one family occupies the house for that week. It's got a game room and Nintendo and, you know, all the stuff. 
um, and it's in a wonderful location in Sea Pines. But they come from Atlanta and Charlotte and Orlando and East Tennessee and Cleveland and Cincinnati and Pittsburgh, and you know they they have to get here. We don't we don't fly them in, or uh, a lot of times these families are supported by church organizations, Rotary clubs, and they'll rent a van for the week and come here. But once they get here, they're they're totally taken care of. In part two of the three-part series that we did with you, you shared the story of the very first family that came. Is there another family along the way that really kind of stands out to you that came to stay at the Heroes House? Well, my job in the organization is is really getting out publicly and telling our story. And uh, hopefully that results in in sponsors and uh, donations and and people identifying with with our program and you know there are a lot of stories I could tell but the the one that really stands out the most to me happened some years back in Harbortown uh, when I'm performing the families always like to come to uh, the Liberty Oak and and a lot of times the the hero child will ho- would hold up a sign like they all do you know pick me pick me you know I, I have a sign that somebody will say uh, I'm a I'm a friend of Jim McCormick so Jim McCormick's a friend of mine so if the kid's sitting there and he's got a sign that says I'm a friend of Jim McCormick I better pick him because my buddy Jimmy would be mad at me. So the next night, there'd be 10 signs that they hold up. I'm a friend of Jim McCormick. <laughs> so I see this uh, little fella. He's, he holds up a sign, and he says, uh, I'm the Hilton Head hero uh, kid. Uh, please pick me. So I look at this little fella, and he's been through chemo, and he's frail. And, uh, you know, I'm thinking to myself, you know, I know he wants to come up here, but is it the right thing to him for him? Because I, I never want to expose any child to be ridiculed or laughed at or, or whatever. So he he was just so persistent, kept raising his hand. So finally, I, I said, all right, hey, bud, come on up here. And he had he struggled to even stand up. He was sitting, struggled to stand, stand up. So I left my microphone and went out to him. And the kids kind of, kids are great, you know. Kids kind of made a little uh, aisle for him. And he came up and he, and, and he, probably four years old, five years old, something like that. And I talked to him as I do all the little kids, where are you from, you know, all that stuff, and try to get him to say something funny. And uh, and then um, he sang uh, a little song. And uh, so I'm, I'm relieved because my audience always responds so warmly to these kids, uh, sick kids, well kids, it doesn't matter. They always respond. And so I'm ready to put him down and uh, uh, take him back to where he was sitting. And he said, hey, Greg Russell, you didn't ask me one of the questions. You always ask all the kids. And I'm like, oh, boy, here we go. I said, all right, pal, what what question is that? He said, you didn't ask me what I want to be when I grow up. Obviously, I didn't ask him that question uh, because I could hear a very painful answer, I'm sure. So I, 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 with a little lump in my throat, I took a, a, a deep breath and I said, all right, pal, what do you want to be when you grow up? And in, in a most enlightened, positive way, he said, you know what? My mom told me that I'm going to get to have the best job anybody can have. He said, my mom told me I'm going to get to be an angel. You know, and I thought, wow, if that doesn't put things into perspective, here's this struggling, cancer-ridden, chemo-treated, four or five-year-old kid with a positive, bright outlook, looking forward to whatever was down the road for him. Is that the quietest reaction you ever had from a crowd? Well, yeah, you can see me. I mean, uh, I've told the story 600 times, and I I still get teary over it because the uh, 
children, you know, are so honest and 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 so full of all that is good, you know, and for him to uh, feel that way and, and share that way and, and, and look forward to it. What a life lesson for all of us. I don't care how dark your days are. You know, it's all about attitude and, and all, all about hope for what can be as opposed to where we are. You've done thousands of shows down there. Does that moment stand out as maybe the moment of your career? That was a that that was a a special 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 time. For, it it reaffirmed for me that what we were doing and the challenges we have doing what we do, and all the mail we get years and years after the fact of families being here, it reaffirmed to me that we're on the right path. We're. We're not curing anybody. We're not fixing anybody. We're not doing anything that in the long run is going to make a difference in their lives. But it reinforced that maybe for one moment in time, we're providing something special for these families. When I was looking through the website, I went through the and saw the family photo page. What really struck me about that page was the smiles on these families' faces. They're facing, obviously, very trying and challenging times. And there seemed to be so much joy in those faces and those smiles. And these are people that probably didn't have a whole lot to be smiling about. As someone who has spent most of their career entertaining children and families, what does that mean to you? It means uh, it means the world to me. Um I have been so blessed in my life with a great wife, great children, great career. I'm not a star. I'm not famous. But I live in in paradise. And I've seen the world. I've traveled the world. I've, I've been so blessed professionally and personally in my life. And I can't imagine what it's like to have a four or five-year-old who you're going back and forth to visit in the hospital or take for treatments and, and, and what that must mean. Um, you know, I had a lady, uh, one night, uh, grab me after a show and, and just throw her arms around me and, and hug my neck and, and tell me, uh, you know, I, I can't believe you didn't know us from Adam. You, you still don't know me. I'm meeting you right now for the very first time. And yet you have embraced my family and brought us here and provided such joy for us. If if I have a legacy, which I'm not sure I do, but if I have a legacy, those are the kinds of things that are meaningful to me. The fact that we have touched the lives of not only the sick child, but the siblings, mom and dad and grandma and uh, everybody uh, associated with that family. The fact that we've touched them just for a moment and made life just a little easier and a little friendlier and a little more sunshine um, uh, is means more to me than any stage I've ever stood on or any standing ovation I've ever received. When you came to the island in 1976, you had no place to live. You were sleeping in the back of a Chevy van behind the red and white, which is now the Piggly Wiggly, until Mr. Frazier handed you the keys to a condo over Harbor Town, and you lived there for four years. What would Mr. Frazier think about what you're doing, how you are handing the keys to these families to spend a week on the island and in the resort that he just so loved and so cherished and how you're, you're giving back uh, to these folks? Well, he was, he was alive for uh, some of this in, in the uh, early time, and he was all about family. He was always nothing made her, him happier than to see a family of 12 with kids and mom and dad and grandma and everybody on bicycles riding to Harbor Town to go get an ice cream cone or play at the play park or uh, come look at the uh, big yachts or go to the lighthouse. It was all about the family experience for him. And I think 
he would have been very happy and very proud that Hilton Head, Sea Pines in particular, has served as a magnificent backdrop for not only the rich and the wealthy and the people are just sailing through life, but these that uh, aren't as fortunate right now and are experiencing some some hard times. I, I think he'd, uh, I think he would uh, be very uh, appreciative of that. I think it's a great lesson for everybody about, you know, the charity and the being generous to somebody and how down the road. Because if he hadn't provided you a place to live, you may not have stayed here. You may not have had your career here. And this effort and this nonprofit would not exist. And all these families would never get the experience. So it's just that one generosity is like, Hey, here's a a place for you to stay, you know, and decades down the road, thousands of families have had the opportunity to come here at no expense and, and enjoy the, the wonderful place that Hilton Head is. Tell me about the gala that you do. Well, we didn't do it last year because of the COVID thing, but once a year we have a black tie affair and, uh, uh, you know, people come and there's great music and great food and, uh, you know, a big silent auction. But it's really a, a, a time for us to thank our supporters and uh, the people who make donations and and uh, all of us get together really the only time of the year that that we do that now we do sp- special smaller events out on the boat or we decorate the hero house for Christmas and we invite our, uh, uh, some of our bigger supporters to come and we do a little Christmas show and, uh, uh, sit around and tell these stories, but the big gala, I hope we, you know, we get to do those again in the past, but uh, as we have in the past, but, uh, I, I'm not sure how that's going to work. Two quick things. If, if, if you don't mind, uh, when I was, parked behind the red and white supermarket all those years ago. I would come back from the beach, and back then we didn't lock any doors. I didn't lock my van up. Um, There would be a uh, grocery bag sitting on my passenger front seat of my van, and it'd have fruit and sandwiches and, you know, a thing of cookies or whatever. And I thought to myself, I didn't buy those. Where did those come from? And this went on and on and on all uh, all summer long. It wasn't every day, but it was on a very regular basis. So I, I never knew where those came from. So years and, and years later, I was speaking at a Rotary Club, I believe it was, and I was telling this story about these sandwiches showing up in my van. And this gentleman approached me and... Uh, uh, he said, I know where all those came from. And I said, where? He said, my dad, Gene Martin, who owned the Red and White Supermarket. This was his son, David, who now runs it all. He said, that was what my dad liked to do. He, he gave out hundreds of turkeys to people and during the holidays. He brought you sandwiches, and he didn't want to be known for it or recognized for it at all. So when you combine Charles Fraser giving me a place to live and a guy like Gene Martin, who I had little or no relationship with him, let me park there and and, uh, brought me sandwiches and whatnot. So fast forward to last year, I get a call from... A local guy here named Hank Noble. He was a school principal for a long time and very active in the community. And he called me on his, obviously on his cell phone. And he says, uh, hey, Greg, this is Hank Noble. I'm calling from the, the Hilton Head chapter of the Hilton Head Hall of Fame. And we would be honored if you would. And the phone starts breaking up. And I'm getting every fourth word. And our event is on. And and if you would be there, we would like to honor. So I listened to it four or five times. And I'm only getting very small part of the picture. So I walk in the living room. My wife, Lindy's sitting there. She said, you got a goofy look on your face. What's going on? I said, I just got a call from Hank Noble from the Hilton Head Hall of Fame Committee. And I'm not sure, but I think they're going to induct me into the 
Hall of Fame. She looked at me as only a wife can. She said, honey, <laughs> I love you, but they don't put you in the Hall of Fame for singing under a tree. <laughs> So finally, I called Hank back, and he told me the rest of the story, which was they were enshrining Gene Martin into the Hilton Head Hall of Fame, and they had heard about my story, and they asked me if I would be the speaker to induct him into the Hall of Fame. Wow. How cool is that? That's very, very cool. How cool is that? It's amazing how... You're speaking at a rotary event, you know, and, and his son is like, oh, by the way, I know where those came from. Yeah. It's it's those little things in life that, that really make, you know, it's it, to me, it's kind of all about the journey, not really about the destination. Yeah. Uh, which is a lot about what this whole series with with Hilton Head is. And and the reason I started, started this podcast is everybody's got a story. You know, there's a million of them out there and we're going to discover them as, as we head down the road. You also do a golf event that has a very unique feature to it that I had never really uh, seen before. It's called Birdies for Charity. Tell me how that works. Well, the PGA Tour here comes here every April. And I don't know how many years ago when we were thinking about uh, the Hero House, uh, trying to figure out if we could afford it or not, the PGA has a program called Birdies for Charity. So if you can get uh, people to make a pledge uh, for all the birdies that are scored during the four days of tournament play here, you pledge a penny a birdie or a dollar a birdie, what, uh, whatever, then the PGA Tour uh, matches that through the local uh, PGA organization, through uh, the Heritage Foundation. So we were one of the earliest people to really jump on that and, and go out and spread the word. And so people b made donations um, over the first two or three years of that program. And those were the funds that came to us that we used to make a down payment on the Hilton Head Hero House. Uh, fast forward up until two years ago, three years ago, whatever it was, uh, we were one of three uh, charities recognized by the PGA Tour worldwide for the work that we were doing hand in hand with the PGA Tour. One of three. Um, so that was, that was a great start way back then with the tour a great relationship has existed jim nance the famed uh, cbs sportscaster is on our board of directors he's one of my dearest friends in the world and has jumped in and done things that i know he doesn't want me to talk about but uh, has made a huge impact on hilton head heroes some of the golfers um, Corey pavin peter jacobson paul azinger Payne stewart some of the newer guys coming along now uh, have jumped in and, and and been very supportive so uh, you know what a great relationship that the tour comes here and uh, yeah it's a golf tournament but they have invested and made certain that millions and millions of dollars come back into our community here to support a, a, a wide variety of uh, charities uh, with Hilton Head Heroes being one of them. That's fantastic. A lot of listeners out there are going to wonder how they can help, whether it's through the birdies or there are other avenues for them to actually get involved and, and help the organization. Yeah, if you go to the website, it's hheroes.com. Uh, there's a variety of ways you can get uh, uh, involved as a volunteer, as a supporter. Uh, you can help us adopt a family. Um, uh, there's a lot of ways to help. So that's the best place to start. Greg, thank you so much for being with us. My pleasure. Thanks. At the end of this interview, Greg and I just sat and talked for a few minutes. He shared with me that he is working on some new music and one song in particular. He even sang part of it for me. I am not going to reveal what it is or what it's about, but you will enjoy it and it will probably be one of his instant classics. Look for it sometime in the summer of 2021. Greg is a kind, gentle, and generous man. His career started because he took a risk. He came to a place he had never been before with nowhere to live, knowing no one on the island, and making almost no money. 
sleeping in his van behind a grocery store just to live his dream of entertaining and playing music. There are risks in life. Sometimes they work out and sometimes they don't. It's part of the journey. The risk he took worked out. It was originally a two-week deal to play in Harbortown. It's now 45 years later. While his talent allowed him to entertain, it was the kindness of others that allowed him to continue. Anonymous bags of food placed in his van and a key given to him by Charles Frazier. Acts of kindness that allowed him to carry on singing under a tree and entertaining crowds of families. God willing, Greg will get to choose the timing of his exit from the stage. Not everyone gets to do that. At some point in the future, it will no longer be his voice singing under the Liberty Oak as the sun sets over the sound. Someone else will take that stage and carry on. In the series about his career, he talked about being missed when he is gone. Hopefully that day is decades away, but it will come as it does for everyone. No one here gets out alive. And when that happens, he will be missed. There is no doubt about that. But he will also be welcomed. Welcomed by more than a thousand children and counting who left this earth and their families far too early. They are sitting on a stage, holding their signs, waiting for Greg to come sing to them. Waiting for the man who found a way to give them and their families an experience they couldn't afford a week at the beach. Something many of us take for granted. Sadly, there are so many more families and not enough capacity to hold them all. The gifts that Greg was given early in his career, he has repaid a thousandfold and counting. He and Lindy and those who serve with the foundation should be commended for what they have done. It is a true blessing for those families who are lucky enough to be chosen to spend a week in the house. I hope you will find it in your heart to support what they do. HHheroes.com is the website. May you have safe travels down 278 to Lighthouse Road. Mm-hmm.